I was getting on a bus at Acadia to come home for Christmas one year. As I dropped my backpack and settled into my seat, I noticed a 90-year-old woman shuffle on the bus behind me. I remember looking at her with such envy because she was so near the end of her life and I was longing for my life to be over. I thought to myself, how did I get here? How did I go from being a top basketball recruit to this lifeless skeleton? Unfortunately, this story is not just mine. This treacherous road is walked by one in six women today who are suffering from an eating disorder of some kind. If you know this story, why do you think we feel this way about ourselves? For me, I learned at a very early age that it was more advantageous to be a boy than a girl. I noticed that the respect that was so easily granted to my older brother and father, my mother had to work so hard for. And so I did the smart thing, and I attempted to be just like them. By the age of 12, I was weight training heavily to develop a more masculine physique. And by grade 12, my basketball career had peaked, and I was recruited by all the top universities. I had done such a great job of masculinizing my body that one day after a co-ed community game, a friend came running up excitedly and said, Jenny, you cut off your head. You look just like one of the guys out there. Like, it was an amazing accomplishment. But I wasn't a man, and I wasn't sure how much longer I could pull off this identity. Plus, the fear of failing at university basketball was so threatening that I had to give myself a way out, and one that would preserve my frail ego. Enter anorexia. It was the perfect solution. And it helped to numb the pain that I'd incurred from being a woman. You see, I was brought up to be polite and, and had a hard time standing up for myself. I'm sure some of you can relate. I was taught to be polite, and so my sexual boundaries were, were crossed on a repeated basis, from my boss at the pizzeria to uh, a classmate on a school trip. And it became pretty clear to me that being a woman was dangerous business. And so I rapidly lost my body weight, my period, my breasts, my womanhood. But those women, the skinny women in the media, they promised a life of success. And I couldn't wait to crush university life with my new look. Well, I did succeed at being the thinnest girl on campus, but I was also the most unwell. Anorexia and orthorexia, exercise addiction, were my way of cleansing myself of my repulsive feminine energy and my attempt to drain the sorrow from my bones. I truly thought that being skinny would make me feel more powerful, but instead, it stole my power. In my graduating year, I was miraculously given a glimmer of hope, an invitation from Mother Nature to come and heal in her midst. I spent that summer in the majestic Rocky Mountains, guiding visitors through the hiking trails. Each day, as I walked through the exquisite beauty of nature, I wondered if maybe, just maybe, some of that beauty lived within me too. From here, I went on to teach high school in Vancouver. I was very functional on the outside, but still lost and vacant on the inside. Over the years, I noticed that men responded quite favorably to my sexuality. Owning, or rather using, my sexuality felt powerful, and the attention I got was intoxicating. My 20s were spent luring men into my web, just long enough for them to fall hopelessly in love with me. When things became too close, I got scared that they'd discover my shameful secret, that I was a fake and not worthy of love after all. And so I'd use that classic line, it's not you, it's me. 
Abuse of the feminine takes many forms. For me, I distorted her, I starved her, I sexualized her, but none of it brought me peace. As the saying goes, when life knocks you to your knees, you're in the perfect place to pray. All of these unsuccessful attempts at finding love and acceptance led me to the Camino de Santiago, where I prayed for guidance through the 800-kilometer pilgrimage through Spain. From there, I was led to study yoga in India, where I was introduced to the great mystery of my true self. Gradually, as I flowed through movements guided by my breath and sat in stillness surrounded by the energy of the tropical forest, I was able to release the years of self-abuse and beliefs of unworthiness. What I realized was that it wasn't about changing anything. It was about embracing the only person I could ever be, myself. As I invited the exiled feminine back into my life and healed my fractured being, I was able to piece together my physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual self. And finally, I could accept that within me lived a bright and beautiful light that also lived within everyone. The day before I left India, I was on my way to the yoga school when the rickshaw came to a brief stop at an intersection. As I looked out the window, I made eye contact with an old woman selling watermelons, at which point she leaned toward me with a laser-sharp gaze, looked into my soul as if to say, I am bound by my poverty and my caste, but you are not. Go do something great with your life on behalf of all women everywhere. <sighs> Upon my return to the Maritimes, I decided to help other young women who might be struggling to find their way in this confusing world by compiling all of the teachings that helped me to heal into a manual. While I was writing, Retea Parsons took her life as the result of sexualized violence and cyberbullying. I was gutted by the news, but I channeled my grief, and Girl on Fire Empowerment was born. Now in its fourth year, Girl on Fire is spreading into schools and communities across North America, inspiring a new generation of young women to own their feminine strength. And they do this by cultivating their 10 inner treasures. It is so rewarding to know that girls of various backgrounds, from the highly academic to the at-risk, are showing measurable improvements in things like confidence, resilience, and optimism. What's more, First Nations female educators are bringing this work to First Nations girls which we're calling Keeper of the Fire. By adding culturally relevant activities, First Nations girls are being inspired to take pride in their culture and to uphold the rich traditions that kindle the heart flame. So what is empowerment anyway? Well, it's not power over anyone else. It's not even power over yourself. And it's not about success or failure either. As Nelson Mandela once said, I either win or I learn, but I never lose. According to Marion Woodman, true feminine empowerment is about the willingness to live authentically, to author your own life. It's about knowing who you are and having the courage to speak what you believe. True empowerment is about respecting yourself on every level. And that's why each Girl on Fire class finishes with the acknowledgement of the three centers of power, the body, the mind, and the heart. Oh, the body. <laughs> It's hard to drop into the body and stay there, isn't it? There's pain, there's judgment, there's loathing, 
And our culture profits on this. Plastic surgeries are at an all-time high, with children as young as nine augmenting their bodies. But the ancients told us that the, the body is a temple, and the yoni, the womb space, is considered the source of all that is sacred. Each and every one of us has come from creative feminine energy, and that's worthy of reverence. The mind. The mind is where we have the power to be our greatest cheerleader by choosing thoughts and beliefs that support our highest potential. Turn down that nasty inner critic and turn up that supportive cheerleader. Within the heart is where we access the power of love, our true superpower. When we can learn to live wholeheartedly, we fall in love with ourselves, we fall in love with life, and we fall in love with the work we're born to do. By tending to these centers in the body, we create a strong vessel that houses the body, mind, and spirit. I invite you to embody these centers and come home to yourself so that you can radiate a powerful presence and glow with a warmth and light. In the end, let's create a sanctuary for our innermost self. And when we do that, we can become a sanctuary for other women and lift up our future generations. We have weathered through the storm Thank <laughs> you.